great. Hey guys. Hi. Okay, should we start? Yep. Okay, so welcome to the Engine API uh, discussion call number two. And actually this is the discussion session around Engine API number three, because we uh, had an extra session during the previous ACD call. Um, so the agenda, the format of the call is uh, the same stays the same so if you want to ask something or just uh, put a comment uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point um if we are falling into some deep discussion around some mm, particular thing uh we will likely uh, break it and uh, follow up on that in the discord in order to not um, like uh, like destruct the general line of of this um, call. So, and also we have an agenda for today. So we'll start from some small change to the minimal set of methods that has been done since the previous uh, discussion session, and then go to the transition process. And I'm not too optimistic that we will reach the end of the document today, but I think we should cover most important parts uh, by the end of this call. Okay, so let's get started with the change to the minimal set of methods. Uh, first one is that it's been discussed on Discord, I guess, uh, with uh, Micah and Jim. And I think it makes sense uh, if engine prepare payload is not, like if, if like uh, building a payload in advance is not supported by a client, it should be implemented as a no op. So it will just do nothing, but uh, the consensus client uh, will, will will not have to uh, adjust its uh, usual block building flow depending on the client on the execution client implementation. So it makes makes a lot of sense, uh, and I don't think anything to um, comment here. Um, next is the get payload implementation will now depend on the prepare on, on the support of prepared payload if it's fully, fully supported then get payload should must re return immediately with uh, what has been built whatever it is even if it's just the empty payload so the uh, consensus client will have a guarantee that it responds immediately but if the um, like prepare payload is not is a no op is not implemented then get payload will work as follows it's just will go to the mempool uh, select transactions from it build the payload and return back so it will go some delay um, also prepare payload and get payload might be um, um, overridden by the uh, like by by clients that are optimized for MEV. Um, and in this case, the prepare payload will be no op, and the get payload will, uh, if there is the, the block builders in place, it will just uh, return the fully, a full payload to the consensus client. So it will also, it should also work like, um, it should also be an immediate uh, return. And uh, yeah, this is just an opportunity for um, MV clients, how it could be implemented. So the, is, the Mike. Uh, so so uh, maybe we can discuss this further in Discord. I, I thought we talked about and agreed to, and it sounds like uh, we misunderstood each other. That get payload would always return immediately, and um, it's up to the execution engine to you know figure out how to do that. If they're running an MEV client of some kind, that might just be you know grab latest block and return it because presumably if they've already pre-validated those, or if they're not running MEV, then maybe they should return empty block or they return a block they built previously. But I thought that get payload was always supposed to return right away, like as fast as possible. And if so, you want to do more processing, you should do it after you get the prepare. OK. OK, I see. So it just builds a block on the prepare payload and doesn't update it, right? This is like the potential implementation, the potential behavior. 
if it's if if the client doesn't support this uh, constant uh, update and of the block that is being built. So even in that case, like I guess my assumption is from from like an API design standpoint, it, it's very beneficial if the there are strong guarantees that the consensus client can rely on, and timeliness of response to get payload is important because if you have if the consensus client can rely on a very fast response from get payload then they can wait to the last minute to send it, which is desirable because you want to wait as long as the kind of client feels is reasonable um, because you're more likely to get better transactions, more expensive block, et cetera. Whereas if the consensus client has to assume that the get payload response may be slow, it means they have to send the get payload request sooner, which means you have less time to build a better block. And so I thought, again, we, we can talk about this more in Discord. Um, I, I think you and I must have misunderstood each other as well. Yeah, 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 I see, I see. Yeah, I get it, yeah. And yeah, I tend to agree with that. Can we specify like a, a time constraint that we would need to have a response by? I think the trickiness with the time constraint is that it's highly dependent on your like uh, internal your architecture. If you have your consensus and execution client both running the same machine, then you know the round trip time is less than a millisecond. And so you might have you might be able to wait until kind of even more the last minute versus if you're running distributed, maybe across multiple data centers or across multiple machines or across the world or whatever, then you need to send it much sooner. And so I worry about kind of doing a protocol level time constraint there um, just because it's, I feel like it's highly dependent on your architecture. I think like your the constraint is don't use this message to start doing really hard work and instead to Final, you know, finalize the bundling of a block and pass it along. Isn't isn't that what prepare payload is? This is in the case where prepare payload wasn't called. Oh, uh, so yeah. So if, if, if a get payload is called, essentially, like should it at that point try to do hard work or should it just pass what it has, which may be not something very good. And I think the implication here is, pass what it has, it might not be very good, or maybe it uses some sort of pending block structure and it should just pull from that but it shouldn't be a an initiation to like do work that's going to take a second or three or eight um i think that prepare payload uh, must be uh, called in any way anyway so it should be like a requirement so that get payload follows the corresponding prepare payload call sure i meant if prepare payload was a no op then oh yes yes Okay, I, I, I felt you. But regardless, yeah. It wasn't cold. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I have a question. So, what is the what is the consensus uh, uh, engine supposed to do between the calls of prepare to prepare payload and get payload? Um, it's supposed to keep listening to the uh, beacon chain network uh, and probably update the head um, so in between and the call prepare prepare payload once again with the, the new head. Uh, so it may potentially issue multiple prepare payloads and then only one get payload. Is this what you're saying? Right. If another prepare payload, the new priority say, uh, arrives. Yeah. So it will, the process of building a block will be restarted uh, with like. So, so, so what I'm getting it is that the, the reason why this uh, things has been split into p two pieces, right? The into prepare payload and get payload is that because you might have a multiple of the first and only one of the second, right? Um, the initial reason is that uh, the proposer wants to start, uh, wants to initiate uh, the building of the payload in, in some advance. Uh, it knows that uh, like during the next slot or uh, the next couple of slots, uh, like the next uh, few slots, uh, it will have to propose a block. And at some point it, in advance, it starts uh, some point prior uh, the slot that it's supposed to propose. Ah, okay. And, and, yeah. and so it has all the information to prepare it, but it's not yet the time to, to do it, Correct. is it? But right, what, actually, is, yeah, actually. Other than the they, continuous nature of like proof of work where you're always about to try to, you're always trying to make a block. This is, I actually know I'm going to be proposing a block and call it four seconds. So I signal that the work is done and then I, I don't have to have this like pending block operation running continuously, which apparently is pretty heavy depending on the implementation. 
actually, uh, yeah, this random parameter makes it uh, no in this parameter. I mean, it, it is like is it is only known after the parent block has received. So right. upon so, receiving the parent block, it will. Yeah. And every time the there's a new head, the um, prepared payload needs to be called like um, after in order to, to start building the block from that head. If there right. was a reorg, yes. Yeah, and also if uh, like the block from the previous slot is uh, delaying, um, it could arrive uh, later, but uh, um, the proposer so, might want to. So it seems to me that this reason, the real reason why we have it right now, not in original reason, is that you wanted to make this operation of preparing parallel interruptible so that you don't have to keep, because obviously you could run it in multiple threads and you know, the, choose the one that you wanted, but you really want to interrupt the previous work to restart the new work, right? Uh, actually, it depends. Yes. Uh, I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah, we have an option here. So we can add to the protocol that there is an option. Uh, no, because I think it's everything else could be could be simulated with other means. I think the, I'm trying to understand the real reason but why the, it's the real reason is that the when we were speaking with Beth on a call previously is that there was only the get payload, um, which implied that either work needs to be continuously done before, uh, kind of like how pending block is done today, um, or it needs to be done at the at that call, which can take a long time to get something valuable. And now that we know uh, wh what the proposer knows, at least four seconds before proposal, maybe eight. Uh, that they're going to propose and what they're going to build on, they can send that signal. And so that work, rather than the continuous pending block work uh, being done all the time, they can just signal to do it and then get it. There's the exceptional case that you then might want to handle where there's a reorg in that time frame, which is actually very unlikely um, in this, this configuration. But uh, you could get, say, Eight seconds before, I think this is going to be the head that's going to be built on. I know I'm going to be the proposer. I send it. Um, and then four seconds later, I actually had a reorg and I want to override my previous repair payload. And then at the time of me proposing, I call get payload. And so the the motivator is is the is the prior thing that I've said, but then you need to handle the case where a reorg happens, which is why you might send to prepare payloads. Yeah, right. Just so not doing I any extra okay. yep. I have a follow-up question. Is there any sense if like we get multiple prepare prepare payloads to construct multiple blocks and then one of them would be chosen on gate payload? Or is it like if we get another, we definitely should cancel the previous work? Is there any like um, use case for that? Uh yeah, I've outlined in the uh like the section that is in, in the bottom of the document. Uh, yeah, it might be the case when you're, um, the, there are multiple consensus clients uh, that are using these, uh, that are sharing one execution client and they are concurrently building, a, wants to build, the, want the, the payload to be built on top of different uh, uh, parent blocks, but that's an exceptional use case and it should not be like, yeah, I mean, that's also access. implying there's multiple heads, which is not, I think, generally how this API is being designed. Right. And yeah, and it, it will have to support uh, like multiple versions of mempool from what I understand. If we want to keep building the payload um, on top of different heads, and if, if these two heads are on the same chain, right, if this is if uh, this is uh, these are the parent and the child blocks, so it doesn't make sense to keep building the, uh, the payload on top of the parent block if you already see that there is a child. Um, yeah, so, in case of the child has been delayed and uh, was running late. Just to understand the, the dependency graph. Um, so the only time it... Every time the, the, if you already called prepare payload and then you call like um, new head, or I forgot what the fork choice updated, shouldn't it just, I mean, would you even need to call prepare payload again or would it, couldn't you potentially just have it assume that, okay, actually you need to restart from this new head. And the dependency you graph should. is always like to, to build a block, you need a head. 
right? But you should restart because this random parameter will be changed. Yeah, it doesn't I, come I, with the book choice updated. The the random that's in there is only known by the next proposer. Is that correct? It's only according to the current spec. Yes. Okay. Uh, but there is a PR. Uh, okay. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not to mention a fork choice updated might even uh, change the proposer shuffling, and so you might not even be building a block anymore at that point. Right. Uh, so. There, Ooh, do I, we get a... you, I don't think you want the fork choice to automatically interrupt this work. Is, is there a cancel build then in that case? <laughs> yeah. Like you get a get payload, fork choice changes. You need to tell the execution engine, hey, stop building. <laughs> You're not the coming up next. You can also just know to cancel if certain timestamp has passed. Uh, but well, it almost it's, a, it's in, it seems to me that like, you know, one thing I first noticed when I saw the separation is that there is this assumption about some state which is inside the um, so associated state. It's a kind of this makes it a stateful API. So when you do the prepare preload, it creates some kind of state that then you later rely on. Um, you know, but then now we are coming to the you know the suggestion. Oh, maybe it should be cancelable. Um, but then uh, you, you know when you call the prepare payload. You implicitly think that uh, the identifier of the state is parent hash plus random. So if somebody else gives the same pair of numbers, then they will be referring to the same one. So I think maybe it's it's better to explicitly return some kind of uh, state ID than you can manipulate it doing cancellation or whatever you want to do. Because uh, there's there's kind of lots of implicit state here, and then it might be that different. It might actually be complicating uh, the discussion. I um, think it's technically stateless. Like I definitely see where you're coming from with it being a stateful because you're you're saying like you, you anytime you have you know a, a then b sort of situation, um, it generally looks stateful. I'd push back slightly just because the get payload actually contains the exact same information set. And so the prepare payload is more of just like a warning that you can choose to heed or not that's saying, hey, I'm going to be asking for payload later with these exact parameters. Feel free to start working because when I ask for it later, I'm going to need it right now. And the, the execution client can choose to not do that. Like it does, you, Technically, you could have an execution client that completely ignores prepare payload. It is not actually required for the protocol. It's just required if you want to be able to have time to actually build useful blocks. Like if you're OK with not building useful blocks, um, you don't technically need it, which is why I think it's, it feels like it's not actually stateful, just because it's more of just like an advanced warning system. Well, it is uh, you, essentially not what you said is that the, the combination of parent hash or random is timestamp in there. It's like a kind of this ID of this stuff, which is uh, it's, it probably. I, would say it's, I wouldn't say it's an ID. It's more just like I'm about, it's saying I'm going to, in four seconds ish. I'm yeah. going to send a request to ask for a thing, and that request is going to ask for these something built that's a function of these four four items. Um, if you didn't get that for some reason, you would still get the follow-up request, and you would still be expected to re respond to the follow-up request just the same. No, no, sure, the, sure, the, sure. The prepare payload is just like a, a heads up. No, no, like no sure, but the, the, you know, there's a lots of different lots of questions. If you don't specific specify what is the ID, then you say, okay, what if I have one request which has got parent hash and timestamp, but another one has the same parent hash but a different timestamp. Do I need to keep the first one or replace it? Mm, I, uh, huh? I mean, I, I, you know, oh, oh no, of course, we, we probably know the answers to all these questions, but it would be uh, good to specify what is the actual ID of, the, of this request, because basically kind of request so, yeah. ID or something. Yes, so, uh, so an execution client could, could definitely implement that by just literally just concatenating those four parameters yes. or hashing them. And, and that would definitely function as a request ID. And I can definitely yes. appreciate an execution client choosing to implement that it that way. And so that way you can decide, you know, okay, this is the one that's associated with that. Like internal, if your internal architecture, that's more amenable. I think that would definitely work um, because you will get the exact same parameter set in the get. Right. And I would like to read the prepare payload call as um, like in a similar way as in the proof of work, uh, the new block has come and become the head and you need to restart the process. Uh, 
which is constantly happening. Uh, the process of building the block, uh, if yeah, if this is turned on, I don't know if it's turned on or turned off. If there is an option to turn it on or not. Um, I mean, like the Geth uh, behavior is. So, yeah, any anything to discuss here? Um, I'm not sure what would cause this, but what would what would cause an execution client? or a consensus client not to send prepare payload ahead of time and for where they were just suddenly forced to just call get payload. And then if we we're requiring that it be immediate, would they just send something empty? I don't think it's expected that that would happen. I think it's just, we need to design for it in case like you just got a connection up, for example, and the consensus client had, like as soon as your connection came up, you're immediately up. And so you only got the get just as a hypothetical. It's kind of like it, how blocks are continuously mined and tried to made, be made better simultaneously. And so very likely the logic would follow if you had to do something instantaneous, that would be that like initial likely empty block with very little state transition and the hashing completed. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I agree that given the, that although prepare payload should be expected, and is the proper way to run this API that get payload should be able to be called in the event of like weird synchronization problems without uh, the prior prepare payload. Is it is it a correct assessment that there's we don't know of any like specific situations where you'd expect to receive only the gut? It's just kind of hypothetical edge cases. Um, yeah, I don't see any use case for that. I think it's a fail, a failure. Um, so you yeah. could handle the get payload failure. I don't know. I think you don't want to handle that failure statefully, though. Um, All right, and we there are some sections in this document that covers this kind of failures. Yeah, there is also the message ordering section, which is new, which proposes much like just strict uh, message ordering. And we can discuss it later. So unless uh, somebody wants to say, uh, um, I think here. I a second question. If if if, okay. if the or if the execution client fails to, to fails to respond to get payload in time, and you have to propose a block, can you just propose an, a block with an empty execution section, like basically like a beacon block as they are now? Um, in if, this if case, uh, consensus client. Like, what does it mean fails to respond in time? So it will respond later or what? Or not respond at all? If, yeah, supposing it doesn't respond and you have a, you know, you have to propose this block, will the beacon client be able to propose a block with empty execution payload itself? It is a fallback. Yeah, theoretic theoretically, it could be implemented uh, as a fallback and with the timeout on get payload response. But the, uh, but the the state root does the state root change if there's zero transactions? No, no, it should not, as we don't have the rewards anymore. So it should stay the same. Is, I thought so. I thought that the consensus clients could do uh, uh, fill slots without an execution payload. Is that not correct? Or is that changing in the merge? That is not. Okay, case. so there has to be something in that yeah. place and that something needs to be valid. You have to still essentially be able to chain something even if that something is empty. Um, right. In that slot, and that I, I see. you so, need to be able to compute the hash uh, and, and a few other, other things. So. Okay, so it needs to be a, a valid block, execution block header, at least. Correct. Like that's the, the minimum required to fill a slot. Yeah, you okay. could. So I, I think that in general, we're designing under the assumption that you can make this request happen. And otherwise your client, which is the unification of these two things failed you and you weren't able to produce block. Um, yeah. You might be able to design yeah. some like logic in the beacon chain client to be able to bypass this by hoisting some of the logic into there. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't go down that path initially. 
right i agree with danny here so we have a client and is we have like a composite client and it just fails to produce a block in this case to propose a block whatever the reason is and it should be identified uh, i mean yeah definitely the empty like the failed proposal will be noticed by the other owner and the investigation will happen yeah validators they notice <laughs> they're monitoring their monitoring uh infrastructure is so sensitive anytime even they like get a non-optimal attestation even when it's included uh they get warnings and they complain so <laughs> Okay, anything else here? Very cool. Uh, next thing, I've added this confirmed block hash stuff here with the like um, tentative uh, list of uh, tags for JSON RBC, uh, which will be extended from what we have now and there is the question by Terence. Um, so, and the proposal to um, like repurpose earliest for the weak subjectivity checkpoint, which makes sense, uh, but could potentially break some apps, I don't know, or tooling that used uh, get blocked by number earliest to get the genesis. I don't know if, if this is a really, really um, frequent use case and important use case. Yeah, but. We can discuss on this uh, later, I guess, in Discord or on like, further um, this kind of call. Um, okay. Yeah, also there is like the, there was the block processing flow. Now there is the block proposal flow, uh, which covers the like block proposal stuff. Um, with the, yeah, there is a couple of sequence diagrams uh, that uh, that are the example of how the block proposal flow should happen. So we may take on it and uh, take take a look on it and uh, yeah, get more understanding. I hope so. Um, yeah. So any questions to the minimal set of methods before we move to the transition process? Um, the transition process is also in the minimal methods like uh, set, uh, but it's something new with respect uh, to, to the Ryanism, um, which is uh, consensus uh, RPC. Um, okay, so we will start from this one. Um, yeah, terminal total difficulty override. Um, I would rename this to terminal total difficulty updated because it's not only gonna use for override, but for also to set the initial value of the terminal total difficulty that is computed by the consensus layer at the merge hard fork and then communicate it to the execution client. So it maps on the terminal total difficulty property from the EIP. And yeah, it could be reused further uh, to uh, override the terminal total difficulty with a new value in case if we want to accelerate the merge and uh, there is the corresponding pull request to the consensus specs repository um, that adds this uh, possibility. And uh, um, yeah, the, the like scenario will be uh, the following, uh, the consensus client gets restarted with the terminal total difficulty override parameter which you will, uh, and this is how the overridden value will be passed to the consensus client and then consensus client upon a startup and connection to the execution client uh, will communicate this uh, overridden value and the execution client uh, must um, update this value and um, act accordingly according to the EIP uh, specification. Yeah, um, we should probably state, and I, I think this is probably implied in how this event will be handled in 3675, but probably say that it's a, you know, it's a no-op or can be ignored if the, uh, 
transition has is in process or completed. Maybe scope transition implies that. Yeah. Um, okay. See. Uh, actually, um, yeah, we should also add the corresponding event to the EIP, like which yeah. says that yeah, that the terminal difficulty should be updated upon receiving this event, uh, and uh, with this event, will uh, the new value will come. Okay, so there is, um, yeah, let's go through uh, like these two and then stop for questions. Uh, terminal perform block override uh, is the, and another way to accelerate the merge. So in this case, it, uh, it overrides also the total difficulty transition based on total difficulty and uh, directly specifies the uh, exact terminal proof of work block. And it means that the proposer um, will need to uh, be start building the proof of stake chains to, to build the transition block on top of this exact proof of work block. It also implies that mm, uh, that execution client, for example, uh, should uh, must uh, stop processing blocks after this one it must uh, disable um, the block gossip upon receiving this um, message and some other stuff, which is it, which is not yet clearly specified by the CIP, but it will be um, specified like well, once we once we get to like, this functionality. So it will be updated in the EIP. So for specifying uh, this is also minimal set really just the first method is part of that minimal set like to get you know implementations going right um sorry you mentioned minimal set do you mean minimal set like minimal set to be a functional client or minimal set to on like the next wave of of uh dev nets uh no no it's like minimal required set for uh, okay gotcha, like gotcha. Or the yeah, the function client. So this transition stuff is critical. Yeah. I, okay. So yeah, there there will be a corresponding um, parameter in the consensus clients that will set this value and communicate it, and then consensus client communicates it to the execution client. Likewise with the total difficult stuff. Would would there be any advantage to using a block height instead of a block hash? Because you don't you only know the block hash right as it's as it's been made uh, the when it is certain block because in case of a, like attacks uh, there might be multiple blocks at the same height and we need to specify the exact block uh, that right. the chain will yeah. proceed this is a, an emergency like coordination in which you're picking a hash in the past that you're coordinating on and you're probably taking uh, some chain downtime uh, to do so Gotcha. And and the, the terminal total difficulty is under unless under like attack scenarios is is superior. Um, and we also you don't do the block height. You do terminal total difficulty because somebody could have like a cheap shadow chain uh, that could uh, reach a block height much faster than mainnet and try to take over the merge. So terminal total difficulty is chosen when you're picking something in the future. Yeah. Uh, two, two questions. One, is it expected that the execution clients will have a default terminal total difficulty baked in and they'll only receive that message if there needs to change? Or will they always, can they depend on always receiving at least one of those messages at some point before it happens? Um, they will receive it. Uh, it, it. It's not possible to, to know it in advance. So it will not be hard coded. I mean, it's okay, possible, so you... but uh, we, we, yeah, we, we decided to, uh, th the decision was made to use the computed value. So it will be okay, computed. So, so the execution client will always receive at least one of those messages. Is that accurate? The eternal total difficulty override? Right. You mean, you mean yeah. receive it during one session. So at the end of, at the beginning of every session, it just gets one of those things, right? 
that's the assumption um that's the that's a good question uh, like session of communication right yes so because then it doesn't make an yeah. assumption about whether they stored it in a database or they forgot right. about it or whatever right 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 so uh yeah it will be computed once but it should be communicated every session as you said yes i think it could be written in the spec that uh, the consensus client needs to send those at the beginning of every session to make sure that they're in sync Right. Uh, here is the message. Uh, here is the call that communicates like this kind of stuff. Total difficulty and proof of work block hash. So, and we will reach this place in the dock. Mm, okay. At so, some point. So, so you may actually receive that status message, but not the override. Would that be accurate? Right. If it's been like, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So the 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 override will happen only when when it is overridden or it is set initially. Uh, so second second question, um, the for execution clients, is it easier for any of you to have the block number included in addition to the hash um, for that uh, terminal proof of work block override? Like when it comes to finding some old block, um, is the hash always enough? You never need a block height. Like there's no database architectures that make are easier to find the block with a height. My intuition is that it is straightforward to request by block hash either from the network or from the storage. Block hash should be fine. So Assuming we this block hash is in the database. Yeah, that's I, was, I wasn't sure if everybody's database has a index by block hash, or some of them maybe just actually have like a linked list, for example. No, it's indexed by block hash. We have also uh, separate indexing by number, but it's not from number to block, but from number to a list of blocks if you have multiple uh, siblings. But by hash, okay. you can find both the main branch and the, the, non, the canonical and non-canonical branches. So by hash is the fastest way of accessing the blocks. Okay. Same for us. Um, so any other questions if, here? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. If the session starts with um, communicating the terminal difficulty, um, what like then the purpose of these two calls is if you is so you don't have to restart a session uh if, right. you, if there's an emergency um yeah uh, actually you will have to restart the session if it's uh, yeah the client will be restarted and so so yeah, what what is the yeah. purpose of these two calls then like how would it be um, different right could be, call I think, below. is that the question I, I right right one can imagine a consensus client where you could override the terminal difficulty or the terminal proof of work block via an API without a restart. Yeah. I don't know if any of the consensus clients will do that, but like from a design standpoint, I can see that as being very reasonable. Um, like in theory. Um, anyway. It's the, the consensus client that sends one of these two uh, terminal messages and. Right. They also start the session with information about the terminal. Uh, I see. Uh, so the, right. both of them can change one. at runtime. And one of the, the terminal total difficulty isn't actually known at startup. Like t today, for example, we don't know terminal total difficulty. There will be a point in the future where we will learn what that is. And it was sometime after the merge is scheduled. And so ideally, we wouldn't want to have to restart everything um, just to propagate that new information. Right. Absolutely. This could be sent during the session. And this too will be sent, uh, could be sent at the beginning of the session. That'd be sufficient. Okay. But this one should be supported. Uh, but this Wait. could be uh, supplanted by status message if we will eventually agree on adding the status one. Okay. So moving on to get to work block. Okay, this is actually, this has, um, it pulls the same set of data that the get block by hash. The only difference here, and this is important, is that 
the execution client should request this block uh, that requested by this hash from the wire. If for some reason it hasn't been received from gossip, um, and yeah, we might not want to implement this um, method and uh, instead use the get block by hash, but imagine the case when uh, the whole, uh, the, the node stuck at the transition because uh, it hasn't received the terminal proof of work block uh, via gossip. I am wondering how likely this could happen. Uh, and uh, yeah, if, if, if it happens, only a manual restart can help to recover from this uh, case, from this situation. So it would be great if we have this one, but I'm open to any opinions on that. So what exactly is happening with, uh, when, when would this be called? It will be called when the transition block is received. The transition block is the first proof of stake block in the system. And this method will be used to pull uh, the, the parent of this block and the parent of its parent to verify that this is the valid terminal proof of work block. And uh, yeah, this code is is uh, uh, running in the book choice of the consensus client to accept so, the block. When you call, um... okay, okay. So it's it's I have a proof of stake block, and I'm concerned whether it actually was built on the terminal total difficulty block, like on a, a valid right. terminal total difficulty block, and I use this to. Yeah, you may use this, but it doesn't mm, has this uh, property of uh, making the execution so, client to pull the block from the wire if it's missed in local storage. So this is basically saying, the consensus client is saying, there exists a proof of work block out there that we are very confident exists. If you don't have it, go figure it out. Like do whatever you need to do to get this block. Um, whereas get, get block by hash normally is like, hey, here's a hash. Let me know if you have this block. And we want to be more authoritative here because this is the point where the proof of state client is, or the consensus client is, taking over, right? And so they're saying, you will, you must have this block for me to continue working. Is that accurate? Right, right. But Otherwise they, we are getting stuck here and- They it. imply that when they run execute payload on the transition block too, because execute payload has the parent hash and it's pretty much saying you must have this parent hash and it, you should go find it otherwise. So I, I'm not, I think I'm not understanding what exactly this method's used for. Um, like you you're not execute execute payload instead. you're not executing payload uh, during the the fork choice, right? So you're checking that this is the right um, this is the right uh, proof of stake block, uh, like the right transition block. Um, so with respect uh, to the transition process, not with respect to the like execution yet. So it will be executed later. But at this point, you just want to understand before falling into the state transition function. On and the what, is what is POW block? Does that include terminal total difficulty in it or something? Yeah, let me open it here. So here it is. Yeah, okay. it has all the required and information. Total here difficulty is, is what's going to help me. And here is the code, right? So it's before the state transition. And it's important to be before. If if we get stuck here, so we are not doing the state okay. transition, okay. and that's it. So essentially, we're the not client wants to um, know that this is actually a valid uh, terminal proof of work block the, when it sees the initial transition process, and the exist the other methods don't really help us ascertain that. And so there's an exceptional call here on this transition to make sure that. Somebody didn't create like a bad uh, transition block. Just just because yeah. just because it might be a valid transition, it might not have picked the right parent block uh, or a valid parent block. Okay. Um, I suppose yeah. execute payload can can do that though for you because execute payload knows the terminal total difficulty and could tell you if 
you built off of something invalid, but it might be good to just be explicit here. The execute payload actually doesn't know about all the difficulty, but we can check it inside of the stage position. That is what you mean. I'm saying uh, the execution client knows about terminal solar difficulty. And so if you did execute payload and it was the first and execute payload oh, yes. being built off of a yeah. work block, it could know if that was not. A oh, yeah. You, you, you mean we, we can you, we can defer this check to the execution client? Yeah. This is what and I, right. I, yeah. Um, I'm not convinced that that's correct. I just am now understanding yes, yes. why this block, why this exists. OK. Um, OK. I, I, I want to think about it a bit more. I don't think I have much more to say on that. Yeah, we have already some implementation. We can use this one, but as it's been said, it doesn't go to the wire if the block is missed. Um, uh, the question to the execution okay. client is how often the, do you know how often, how likely the gossip to be, uh, to not deliver you a block or its hash? Um, how often do you do, do you do your like clients have to go to the um, wire to pull the parent of some block that you have received, but for some reason you've missed the parent block? Yeah, I agree with Micah, but so this is fairly unlikely, but it happens especially on like some network blips, etc. So yeah, if you say that we are pretty confident that, that this method will work um, well, so we will just remove this from the design space and forget about well, it. Well, it might not work, but uh, we, we're kind of thinking that it, the, 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 uh, the probability of this occurring everywhere, it's very small. Like it might occur in one or two nodes or something. So it means that if, yeah, uh, there will be a very little portion of nodes that might get stuck, right? Even if we even have these kind of nodes. So yeah. if, if you if you follow the, the like execute payload path, uh, I think the impl implication is uh, that execution, execute payload, if it couldn't, it, if it didn't know the parent would go find it with the network. So it might be better to just run that path. Uh, then we will have to get do this check after execute payload, right? After the state transition. And the execute payload will actually um, has an additional semantics for the transition period. Um, it will need to go to the wire and pull the block if it's, and pull the parent block if it's not in the local storage. And it, already, it already has to do that though, right? In order to validate the current block, you need to know what the parent block was. You need to have seen the right, parent blocks. Right, but currently, a consensus client guarantees that that all previous blocks has been sent to the execution layer. That that I think actually, when you start talking about failure modes and synchronization issues between these two pieces of software, that like the uh, what we've previously discussed is say. Uh, say the execution engine fails, it gets restarted and it's 10 blocks behind and, uh, and the beacon chain client inserts uh, a block that the execution client can then say, no, I don't have the parent or it could actually just go to the network and get all the you know, recursively look up those 10 blocks and handle itself. Um, so it's not out of the question that the execution client actually does do some self-mending when it doesn't have a parent. Yeah that might work. Um, but if in this case, execution client falls into the state sync to pull the state and uh, yeah, pull headers, it might take some time, okay. um, which is, but we are the transition process like it's time critical. Pulling the block from the wire may also take some time, but probably it is like, yeah, but probably it will have to pull uh, like one block and it's parent and so forth. Um, yeah. So, let's... so I think in in all happy paths, it should already have the parent block. I think the right. primary unhappy path is when someone act actively is attacking the transition, and they have mined a the first consensus block on an invalid uh, terminal total difficulty proof of work block. That's the time where you would 
maybe get a request to, hey, um, execute this block. The client doesn't have it because it's not a valid block and it never accepted such a thing. OK. Um, so we are like roughly agreed that it would be better to rely on the get block by hash right and on the block gossip. So let's just yeah, move I, on. I think I'm with, I'm with Danny. I prefer relying on just executing the block later, but um, this might be a good conversation to move over Discord since we're out of time. Right, right, right. Um, OK, the next one is sync. Um, there was a well, like great work done by Alex and Gat team on the merge sync proposal. Um, I've outlined like this this sync status was in this uh, document before, but there is the sync checkpoint set, which is required um, by which is yeah is is one of the required methods here. It sends the uh, to make the execution client aware of what is the block header at the um, big subjectivity checkpoint. And consensus client knows that what the header is because it pulls the state at the big subjectivity checkpoint and it can directly send it to um, the execution client. This is also the first step of the, of the sync process. So it's like initiating the sync process. Mm -hmm. And it also That's might be uh, might be a clear evidence that the execution client should switch to the proof of stake mode. Um, so, I, yeah, a, a bit of context on that. Uh, we will have the execution client software after the merge. Uh, yeah, after the merge happened and before the, any execution client software updates, uh, the cl execution clients will start uh, in the proof of work mode by default as uh, they don't know that transition has already happened. And uh, yeah, they will go to the uh, network to look for the block and the PS with uh, uh, the greatest total difficulty value and so forth and uh, listen to the block gossip and other stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'd like uh, the consensus client to inform the execution client if the uh, transition, transition has already happened and this is how it could be done. So. Once this checkpoint set mass message sent, um, um, aside from the initiating the sync process, um, the execution client may switch to the proof of stake mode and listen to the consensus client ins instead of listening to the blog gossip and, uh, and doing some other Wait, stuff. Does this have to be sent? Like this. Does this have to be sent every time the execution client is started? I guess no. It's it should be sent only uh, on the fresh client startup uh, when there is no um, box or state in the local storage. So if there there is already some state, um, it should not be sent. This checkpoint said uh, actually it depends. If if you are behind the weak subjectivity checkpoint, then it should be sent. It's again, I guess. No, because you just said that it automatically it starts in the proof of work mode, and that sounds. Uh, sounds yeah, it sad. starts in the proof of work mode uh, because it's a fresh client uh, and it doesn't know about the transition has happened on the network. Wait, but we are gonna put the the transition difficulty like into the hard fork for proof of work as well, right? No, I mean, I want to. I want to avoid the situation. Like, imagine post post uh, like post merge, someone ex someone's ex uh, sorry someone's consensus client accidentally crashes. Right, uh, the execution client restarts, and now they are in proof of work mode, but they don't know it, and their dApps will automatically use pro uh, some uh, proof of work chain that's like uh, not really the Ethereum chain. Right, but uh, so that sounds dangerous. Uh, yes, uh, but if they start after, yeah, this like switch, I think it should be persisted by the execution client in some right. storage. So it will just start up in the proof of stake mode if it, it's been informed about it previously, even after it starts. And and also the proof of work client should, if it ever received and um, saved. 
the uh, terminal tool difficulty. It should refuse to ever accept any blocks beyond that, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. And also, uh, shouldn't we put uh, the default value for that just in the client as an inner source code so that it doesn't have to? Like, what if someone just keeps running a proof of work client without starting up their beacon client at all? Then once again, they could end up in a situation where they keep following the proof of work chain. Yeah. So I think the default behavior should be to stop. Like, all proof of work clients should ideally just stop working if they aren't connected to um, a consensus client. All other behaviors are going to be extremely dangerous. Um, I thought, how do we handle the we transition don't... process and prior the merge? I thought we didn't know the terminal flow difficulty until like a week before the merge or something. Did that change? I haven't followed that closely. Yes. So it will be communicated. Like, and it'll yeah, be communicated, but what, we can't hard code it and, because it. Right, right. Well, right we won't right, know right. it until That's after everybody's deployed saying. their clients. Right. Why can't we just like do it, but like with other hard forks, where we all agree on? One block height. We keep the. I mean, I thought the endpoints to set it are for emergency. Like, if you say like, oh, we need to change it, but um, like, yeah, I, I'd stop here uh, and let's continue um, with this discussion on Discord because we have one one minute yeah. to the next call. Okay, thanks everyone. Um, we'll see you soon. I guess. You. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.